Formula One celebrated 70 years in 2020, and only one team has raced in every season. Ferrari. The Scuderia is synonymous with the top echelon of motorsport, and unsurprisingly, it's F1's most successful team. 16 constructors' titles, 15 drivers' titles, 237 wins, 228 poles, and 768 podiums, and counting. With all that history, expectations are always high, making the job of team principal one of the most pressured in Formula One. And when things go badly, as they have done this year, that pressure is ratcheted up again. This week, I speak to the man charged with getting Ferrari back to winning ways once more. Welcome to Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Mattia Bonotto joined the Scuderia in 1995, fresh from university. And over a period of 25 years, he worked his way up the company to team principal. He started out on the engine side, then took overall technical responsibility for the car in 2016 and became team principal at the beginning of last year. Mattia knows Ferrari intimately. He knows what the company means, both to the sport of Formula One and to Italy. After all, he holds one of the most prestigious jobs in the country. He's also worked with some amazing drivers. He and Michael Schumacher joined Ferrari at the same time. And Mattia has worked with three other world champions as well. Kimi Raikkonen, Fernando Alonso and Sebastian Vettel. With each of them, there have been joyous highs and intense lows and always pressure. We discuss it all from Schumacher's first test in red through to the team's current boy wonder Charles Leclerc, around whom the team is building for the future. And Mattia is candid about the team's recent struggles and how they're planning to bounce back. There's a lot in here. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Mattia, thank you very much for your time. It's great to have a chat with you. 25 years at Ferrari. What an incredible journey you've been on with that team. Yeah, it's a long time. You're right. My very first job started as graduate, 1995, after the, the, the university. When joining Soma was a dream, honestly, um, because I was living in Switzerland. I got the opportunity to do a master in car engineering, so after the uni university, nine months in uh, in Italy, in Modena. And through that master, then uh, I had uh, the opportunity somehow to join Ferrari, but that, uh, honestly, a dream, I think the way it happened, very much lucky. <laughs> I think it's uh, because it, uh, oh, as well in terms of timing, uh, as soon, as, soon after I finished the, the university, I made the master, soon after the master I joined Ferrari and it was all in sequence and uh, very much lucky and I joined Ferrari at the time, joining immediately the F1 department, so Gestione Sportiva, as test engineer, uh, engine test engineer at the rea during testing on track and uh, I remember when I tested it was already the, Jean Alesi and Gerhard Berger were driving, so it's uh, somehow it's a long time ago. Mattia, was it always going to be Ferrari for you? Or while you were at university in Modena, did you send letters to all of the Formula One teams? No, no, no. I think I, I wrote only a letter to the Sauber team while I was at the university because I was studying in, uh, in Switzerland and no reply. Um, that's that's actually the only one. Have you told Peter Sauber? Have you told Peter Sauber that he never got back to you? <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> Maybe I should. But yeah, that, that was the only letter. But I, I didn't because I think I had no time simply to do it because, as I said, it was a simple sequence. And uh, it, it all happened without really looking for it. And somehow it has been it has been great. Uh, and then obviously I joined Ferrari. The reason why still after 25 years I'm in Ferrari because I think Ferrari gave me a lot of opportunity to to develop and uh, to develop my curiosity, to develop my um, ambitions. Um, and I think that why changing if you feel comfortable in a team, if you feel comfortable in a, in a company, and you've got opportunities somehow to grow. And um, and really, I feel Ferrari being part of my of my life, no doubt. I often said I'm not working in Ferrari, I'm living in Ferrari, um, because I think that's, that's the way it is. Could the 26-year-old Mattia, 
who joined Ferrari in 1995 ever have dreamt that one day he'd be the team principal? No, and I think it has never been an ambition. When I was a kid, I remember sometimes my, my dream would have been to be aerodynamicist in Ferrari. And uh, I don't know why aero, no, no idea. But aero was somehow my dream. I never did aero. I do not understand the aero. So it's, um, and I started as engine guy and developed through the engine guy. But uh, no, I didn't dream of, uh, and, uh, and I wouldn't even not have dreamt to be in principle one day of Ferrari because it, again, it was not the ambition. For me, the ambition was somehow to join that family, or whatever is the role. It's a fascinating journey that you've been on, isn't it? I mean, can you explain how a guy whose family comes from a small village near Parma has ended up running the most famous team in the world. It's it's an extraordinary thing. I'm even not coming from that from that village. I, I, I'm born in Switzerland. My mother was coming from the village you mentioned, which is near Reggio Emilia, even not Parma, so near Reggio Emilia. My father is from Padova. My mother and father met in Switzerland, so they somehow they married there, I was born there. I studied there. Uh, my grandfather was a fan of Ferrari, and when you live in Switzerland somehow, whatever is linked, and you are Italian, huh? so you are Italian in Switzerland, whatever is linked to your, somehow, you, you feel, you feel the link, you feel it's in something important for you, and Ferrari was somehow an important symbol, an important brand. Uh, when I was young and kid, it was the time of Gilles Villeneuve, so I, I somehow, I was somehow attracted by the races, I, I were watching races with my grandfather, and, um, and I think I, when studying even university in Switzerland, there is nothing which is linked to automotive. Huh? So I was a mechanical engineer, but looking to whatever else which is not automotive. So, and I remember the very first time with John Ferrari as an engine engineer, they asked me, can you draw us, because that was the, the interview I made, can you draw us a valve? I have no idea how a valve was made. And, um, and I don't know why they employed me, by the way. <laughs> But that's really starting uh, as a graduate, knowing nothing about the job, uh, knowing nothing about engines. And, um, and finally, I think my passion certainly for the cars, my passion for the sport and my passion for Ferrari helped me certainly to be committed uh, to, the, to the company, to the team. It's many years, so I think that after so many years, you know very well the organization, you know very well the culture, which I think in Ferrari is a key element. I think it's in that, in terms of culture, it's a very specific and special team. And I think in order to, to lead the team or part of the team, you, know, you need to know the persons and the way they, they, they think. So the culture is key. And I think that the fact that I know very well the team and after so many years gave me the opportunity to grow and to become a day the team principal. Can I ask you about your job interview at Ferrari? Because... I'm just trying to get my head around what job you were going for. They've asked, they've asked you to, to, to draw a valve and you, you couldn't. So what was the job? Who interviewed you? Can you remember back all that time ago? It was, it was the head of the HR of, um, of Ferrari. Because it was through the master. So the master we are, I, I participated to at the time was as well organized by Ferrari. So some of the companies... Uh, around, let me say, Modena, so Lamborghini, Maserati, uh, Ferrari, etc. So, so there was obviously the, the, the people organizing the master because, and there was the people uh, from uh, a person from Ferrari, which was initially the HR, and that was not as first to employ me, but really to, to have a stage, the first stage of uh, as graduate, six months in Ferrari. So it was the head of the HR, and then obviously the people of the mass asked me about the just design of valve, no, no idea. And then I joined Ferrari as graduate, and I think it has been through that um, that stage, which uh, at the time was the director of. Uh, I, I made the stage on the road cars, not in the Formula One. So it was at the on the dynos at the benches, on the road cars. The director at the time of power unit of the engines is Paolo Martinelli who became just at that time the director of the engines in the Formula One at the time of Michael Schumacher. And obviously he, he knew me because of the stage. And when I finished my stage, I, he asked me simply, I would like to somehow to employ you, but on the Formula One department. And we got a position which is the, the position of the test engineer. 
Don't go anywhere because Mattia will be back with more stories in just a moment. But first up, I've got a message for all you runners out there and those of you looking to start clocking up those miles. As you probably already know, getting your stride and technique right is an important part of embarking on a new running regime. But one thing that shouldn't be overlooked is your footwear. Step in the new Fresh Foam 1080 V10 from New Balance. These breathable and plush running shoes combine soft foam with energetic rebound, suitable for casual and hardcore runners alike, that wrap your feet in comfort with every step you take. The soft-fitting knit upper and ultra heel gives you a stylish look, while the full-length fresh foam midsole is made to be fresh for every run, helping you to feel confident and comfortable as you go the distance. The 1080 V10 from New Balance, the best ride on the road. Visit newbalance.com to check them out for yourself. That's newbalance.com. But for now, let's get back into it with Mattia. Look, can we talk a little bit about engines? Because you say you join Ferrari in that department. You've worked across a huge variety of specifications. Back in 95, it would have been V12, V10, V8, V6, of course. Which has been the most challenging, the most rewarding? Which specification have you enjoyed working on the most? Well, you know, when, obviously when I joined, as you said, it was V12, and it was the very last year of the V12, uh, 1995. It was a, certainly a fantastic engine for the sound, but as engineer, as I said before, I was not really well aware of <laughs> uh, the, the technical content. So I, I was fascinated by the sound, I was fascinated by the power, I was fascinated by uh, certainly the object. And at that time I was learning a lot. So for me it was a period where I was certainly a lot curious, so trying to understand and to learn. So. That very first year on the and with the V12, the last year of the V12, I learned a lot, uh, and that has been my my first my first let me say at least the first engine I saw and the, the one I very somehow I got a, a lot of memories. Then through the seasons and the years, so I think that the current v, V6, for the level of complexity, for the level level of technologies we've got, is is the best product so far. So no, that's no doubt. So the level of Perfection has always increased, and I think that if you compare the engines of today to the one of 25 years ago, it's <laughs> it's quite a completely different uh, animal. Uh, no, and uh, and I think, but I think that the, the the first V12, because of the emotions I had at the time, was certainly something which is still fascinating me. And can anything beat the sound of a V12? I think that's that's no doubt. Uh, it's uh, nothing can beat that sound. I remember at the time because that was 95. As I told you, Jean Alesi and Gerhard Berger, and uh, as young engine engineer listening to the discussions, there was still discussion where Jean Alesi was asking for more power, Gerhard Berger for more torque, and then, okay, what, what is torque, what is power, what's the difference between the two, and, uh, and so it was. And, and today, because of the quantity of data you've got, the telemetries, the, the know-how, these are discussions which are even not happening. So. While at the time it was really the driver telling you, for me, drivability is power, not the drivability is torque. And uh, so I think I, I had the opportunity and the chance and the luck somehow to working 25 years in, ago in Formula One, you are learning things because there was no sufficient data of telemetry, or whatever, simply because we are discussing with drivers, trying to interpret what they were telling you. And I think it was more a matter of understanding and feeling the product rather than looking at the data understand the product through the data and uh, and i think a lot of drivers comment at the end you need to pick them up and understand what they mean and before even you start looking at the data while today if i look at the young engineers of these they are certainly even a lot smarter compared to what we were but they are as first looking at the data on the telemetry and eventually listening them to to the emotions and the drivers Back in those mad old days, how many engines would you use over a season, over a Grand Prix weekend? Uh, it's, it's a day I'm looking on, uh, just in, in these days because I think it's important when looking at 2025 or 2026 and we will need to contain the costs. So looking a bit of history, how much they were costing, how much were assembling per season compared to what we are doing today and the change has been 
is very significant. Today we've got three, drive, three engines per driver per season. I remember having been in Japan, in Suzuka, with 17 engines. <laughs> 70, one seven. <laughs> for the engine itself, because you got the, the engines for Friday, the engines for the quality, the engines for the race, then the two cars, the T car, the spares, and eventually even different specifications. So we brought to Japan 17 engines. Amazing. What year are we talking about then? Is that like nine? Is that 1996, 97? Is that what we're talking? 97, 98. Yeah. Extraordinary. Now, while we're talking about that time, um, and, and I, I loved hearing what you were saying about talking to the drivers. Can we just talk about Michael Schumacher because he joined Ferrari at pretty much the same time as you? Um, he had his first test. Uh, at Estoril, didn't he? At the back end of, of 95. Just um, when I say Michael Schumacher to you, Mattia, what words spring to mind? Maybe before to come to what, what words, I, I think the memories of that test, Estoril, is very clear in my mind still today, because I think that was a, a fantastic experience. He joined November 95 at the end of the season, Ferrari coming obviously from Benetton as world champion. He had his very, very first test, not in Estoril, but we did few laps in Fiorano before going to Estoril. The reason of doing the laps in Fiorano was essentially for the uh, driver, driver fit, installation in the car, the seat, uh, whatever was, steering wheel, uh, uh, etc. So, so we check everything was working properly in Fiorano and then we moved to to Estoril and uh, I remember that very first test in Fiorano because he was not capable of turning the very first corner of the track. So he was, he was not capable of doing that corner in a proper way and he was slower on Fiorano compared to the drivers which were used to, to go there and like uh, uh, Jean Alesi, Gerard Berger, Nicola Larini who was at the time our test driver. And I remember that as after that very first test he asked immediately to Jean Todt the first corner has to be changed. I don't want to see it anymore. And we changed the track. <laughs> so the track layout has been changed since that time. Now, hang on, hang on. You changed the layout because Michael asked Yeah, yeah we changed the layout so because the first corner was not representative of any corner of the World Championships. That was the, <laughs> that was the point. So. That's amazing. What, and he just, what, where was he struggling? Was it, was it on turning, exit? Can you remember? I, I can't tell you. I can't remember. But he was struggling. And so we had to change the layout. And then we... <laughs> And then we went to we went to Estoril. We went to Estoril and so test normal testing day. Normally you've got the green light at 9 a.m. We are used to come very late at the circuit, even as technicians, engineers, 8.15, 8.20, just to warm up the engines. Normally the driver was coming at five minutes to nine, put the overall, sit in the car, installation labs and jumping out of the car and starting discussing with the engineers the program of the day. So as usual, in Estoril, first day, we, we went there at 8.20. Michael was already there. He was there waiting for us, looking at the watches, saying, guys, what are you doing? 8 a.m., we've got the meeting. We first start discussing the program, and then we do the installation lab. And uh, so that was since Michael, that now we, we at 8 a.m., we are doing our normal meeting in the morning. And, uh, and the day after, he was already there, just five minutes away, just to make sure that we were all on time for the meeting at eight, and that was the, the approach. And uh, so, on the end, and that was quite incredible. And um, and then, obviously, discussing the program, uh, obviously, we we'll start discussing within the program. So we'll do some tests, whatever is set up, etc. Fifty kilo fuel, and by maybe one hour to go to the end, we should drop the fuel ten kilo quality lap. We do the best lap time, so at least on the day after, on the Italian newspaper, you've got Michael Schumacher, the fastest man of the of the day, and uh, and he said, why why should you drop the fuel? Yeah, because we'll do the fast lap. Come on, we are here for testing and learning. We are not here to do the best lap, so we'll keep 50 keep 50 kilo all the day long. Okay, so that was already, again for us quite a change, not that in his approach, because we are here to learn, to progress, and to and to develop, so no, no lose of time. But by the way, he, he made the fastest lap with 50 kilos. And it was quite incredible because Estoril, the first two corners, right-hand side, fast, fast corners, he was going through flat, 
going through the lab, through the corner completely flight while Jean Alesi and Guerra were not capable of doing it in qualifying in Estoril on the same year with the same car. So I think we learned very immediate, very soon who was Michael. Hard worker, a leader, very strong and fast, no doubt. And I think he, he learned us how to, to approach the the exercise. Fascinating. And and how detailed was his feedback about the engine? How sensitive was he? Could he feel the smallest upgrade, the smallest change? I think Michael was not a person which was very strong in giving feedback, which is opposite eventually to what everybody may think. But what he had, he was so fast and consistent that if you made a change on setup and it was faster, then it was positive. It was slower, it was negative. Because he was capable of being so consistent lap per lap that the, 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 his true feedback was was the timing, was the lap time. So Abzi himself, when coming back in the garage, he would have been a tenth faster. The feedback was positive. <laughs> That's it. Mm, mm. Was he? Did he have any idiosyncrasies? Like Ayrton Senna used to dab the throttle mid corner. Did Michael have any little nuances that were specific to him? No, no. I think uh, no. He was. Um, Breaking very hard, no doubt, but then is uh, was his capacity of always being at the limit of the track conditions and bringing the car to the limit, lap per lap, corner per corner. Would you say that Michael became a friend? Because actually yesterday, Mattia, I was looking on YouTube at a, a video of Michael interviewing you. He was, I think, just introducing all of his engineers and there and there's a young Mattia Benotto being interviewed by Michael Schumacher and I guess you were the same age so so would you say that that it became a friendship as you said we are on the both of us 60 1969 so we've got the same age I was spending 200 days per year at the racetrack with him because somehow it's uh, and somehow it's, it was more often with him rather than my my wife or the family so and uh and Michael was one guy that loved playing football. So, for example, on the race weekend, on the Thursday, we had to have our game and to play football. That was the only uh, way of starting a race weekend. So it was, a, and then after the, 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 the game, we, had, we were always together at the restaurant. So he was a person, because as a leader, again, that was enjoying staying with the team, enjoying staying with the technicians and the engineers. And I think that... Um, we were very close, uh, that's, that's no doubt. And, and uh, was that friend? I don't think we may say friends because at the end it's still uh, it's a work. And um, there is a respect between uh, drivers and engineers and vice versa. So I think you enjoy, you love staying together. Uh, friendship may be something different still. And, and, and final thoughts on Michael. What was it like to ride that wave of success with him from 2000? Uh, as first, I think we, we were not realizing it because when, as you said, you are in the wave, it, it, it is the success you enjoy, you enjoy race per race, and it's only at the end of the entire um, the entire cycle that you recognize how, how, how much you did. And I think that while you are into the, the wave, you, you simply enjoy day per day, and certainly uh, winning is, is, is a great emotion that you cannot forget and I think it's as well a mentality uh, it's not simply something that uh, it's a mentality so it's uh, and it's something that as Ferrari today we need again to regain huh? it's not it's a mentality that you need to build it's a mentality that you need an approach to uh, to the race that you need to, to have and certainly that Mercedes got today uh, no doubt when you are there you're simply enjoying <laughs> day per day enjoying the journey well it's a fascinating comparison because you and michael joined the scuderia when it was rebuilding in the mid 90s as you are now and i was just wondering where are you in the process and can we compare the rebuilding that's going on now to that period 25 years ago yeah i i often myself at least i often compare it i think there are similarity no doubt uh, the first is at Ferrari at the time, 1995 to 1998, 2000, were investing. We were investing as we are investing today, uh, investing on uh, technologies, but investing on people as well. So employing young people, 
and one young engineers. And if I look at Ferrari in the last years, we have employed a lot of uh, young engineers, which today somehow are starting becoming our uh, foundations. Uh, uh, and I think that there was, there was the a leader, a driver, Michael at the time. I think today we've got Charles, which is somehow uh, obviously is not as experienced as Michael because he's not a world champion while Michael was. But I think that we've got a clear leader on track as driver, and uh, and that's that's important as well. I think there is the commitment of the entire company uh, to try to build uh, a winning cycle in the future. And I think there are similarity. Yes, there are. Interesting that you say you've got the leader on track on track in Charles. Um, do you see lots of similarities between him and Michael Schumacher? Both very talented drivers. I think that uh, Charles is, when driving, certainly a talent. He's fast. He's capable of overtaking. He's fantastic in protecting uh, the, the position. I think he's got the mentality in which that he, winning is a clear objective for him. And I think that uh, what is pushing him in his own in all his actions that he want to always try to win. And he's not simply there to participate, but he's there to win. And I think that when he, he put his helmet on, he's on the track as a racer. He's really, I don't think the second place is never satisfactory for him as it wasn't for Michael. Um, but then Charles is a lot younger. To Michael at the time, he need to, as often I'm trying to say, he need to develop as a leader of the team. He has to become because the the success of Ferrari tomorrow will be somehow dependent as well on the way he will behave as leader himself. But I think that uh, while Michael was already a leader, Charles is developing as a leader, but he's developing well. Although there have been no wins this year, have you been more impressed by Charles in year two than you were in year one last year? I, I think this year he drove even better to, to last year. Um, I think he's uh, with a difficult car uh, as he's got this year. I think he has been he has been strong, consistent. He has been capable of adapting himself to the various track layouts, trying to extract the, the most of the potential of the car. So adapting the driving style as well based on tires behaviors i think he, the way he progressed mainly was the way now he understand the tires and he can manage the tires which is not only on the single quality lap where he's very strong but on the race pace so i think as a driver he developed a lot he's again he's stronger compared to what he was uh, and that's that's experience but um, not only as a driver i think that uh, as a man as a man he is is growing and i think he is is very linked and connected and committed to the, to the team, to Ferrari. And uh, I think that our people uh, feel it very well. I, I, I like the way he's part of our family. I think he's, uh, he's really the, the right way of, of acting and uh, I appreciate his, his commitment. We know our listeners are scattered all over the world and travel has been limited for many this year. But don't let that stop you from exploring a world of content with expressvpn you can change your online location so you can control where you want sites to think you're located doctor who fan like me or like discovering new documentaries you can access uk netflix no matter where you're based and still keep up with those shows choose from 100 different countries available on expressvpn and you can potentially stream thousands of new movies and TV shows using your regular streaming service. All you have to do is open the app, choose a location from the list available and hit connect. Not only does ExpressVPN let you change your location, it also encrypts your data so you know your privacy is protected. It's also incredibly fast. You can stream everything in HD quality with no buffering and it's available on your phone, laptop, tablet and even your TV. Go to expressvpn.com slash grid to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. expressvpn.com slash grid. Can you tell me a little bit about Essere Ferrari? What does that mean? We, we see that hashtag a lot. Is that the pillar around which you're, you're building this team? What does it mean? Yeah, uh, as first, when I joined us, well, when I moved into the role of team principal, um, whatever has been my role in Ferrari, I always said, you need to have a clear vision. And the days that eventually I will leave the team or I will leave the role, 
I would like to look back and say, okay, in those years, that's what we've developed. And um, so when, when moving into team principal role, I said, what should be the objective and what should be my, my vision and what sh should I, as a, as a boss or as a leader, try to transfer to the entire team? And uh, the hashtag is a Ferrari, somehow the vision. Uh, what, what does it mean, uh, the vision? You, you may say our vision could be become champions, uh, winning all the, the titles, opening a cycle. But I think that hashtag SR Ferrari is even stronger to that. Uh, hashtag SR Ferrari is somehow being Ferrari is, if you are Ferrari, obviously then you, you will win. Uh, uh, and I think that winning is part of, of being Ferrari. And being Ferrari is more than that. So somehow it's identify what's Ferrari and what it represents, in which it is, it, it's, there is a clear identity which is different to the other teams. And uh, being Ferrari is, is an Italian brand which is very well known, which got a lot of passions, which represent... Uh, and if you look at Monza last year, I think under the podium when Charles won, I think that, that represents what hashtag SR Ferrari represents. So it's uh, not only the entire passion of, of a team, but the entire passion of all the fans around the team. It's, uh, it's racing, it's competing, it's winning, it's passion, it's uh, innovations, it's all what's about being Ferrari represent for the history, yes, but what means, and then the hashtag is to have somehow something which is even more modern than the simple, the past, but looking ahead, no, in a, in a let me say, in a more fashion way, in a more modern way. Uh, so it's, uh, what's important for me, making sure that the team is growing with a clear identity, which has to be our Ferrari identity. You've worked with a lot of team principals at Ferrari, Jean Todd, obviously, then I, I just, I cherry pick, you know, Stefano Domenicali, uh, of course, and then most recently Maurizio Riva Bene. How different are you to the guys who have come before, the team principals? Um, I, difficult for me to judge how different I am. Certainly what I'm trying to do is to learn as much as I can from them certainly for the positive, because there is a lot I, I've, I saw, I've seen, I know how they do it, as they did it, and I know how I can eventually try to do it. So I don't want to be different. Huh? I don't want to be different to us. I think what, what's important is that I, I take that, as, that experience as a positive experience and try to apply what has been the most important or positive from all of them. I want to mention a name to you now, Sergio Marchioni. How much pressure did he put you under? What was life like under him? The pressure was there, no doubt. And I think that that was the most difficult dealing with him. So, and the pressure was such that you had always your mobile next to you day and night because if he was sending you a WhatsApp, you had to reply in within the 30 seconds. And that's the type of pressure he was putting you. And if you are not answering immediately to the whatever text he was, message he was, he was sending you, that then it was a really uh, the, the, the bad start of the day. So and I think that really living with the, the phone next to you was, is not easy huh? because that, that's the, the, the type of pressure. And uh, that was as well his way of putting pressure, making sure that you, has, you are always awake, uh, always ready to, to reply. Would he text you in the middle of the night? He texted me in the middle of the race as well and in the middle maybe not in the middle of the night but early morning no doubt so it was always there a, a lingering pressure do you think that pressure pushed you towards the limit of the regulations last year is there a link could be could be i think that uh, as first i think it's part of the sport try to um, interpret the, the gray zone of the regulations and I think that uh, in that respect, there is all the teams are doing it as a, let me say that, that's a, uh, but then it's what you, you intend per gray or not gray. And I think obviously it's, it's, it's always a limit, which is very borderline and difficult. But yes, certainly it pushed us, not me, but it pushed us a lot, a lot in trying to, uh, let me say, to develop the gray areas as much as we could. How much stress did that cause the team, how much stress did it cause you personally? What happened last year? I learned a lot. 
I think that that's more important. Uh, I learned a lot because I think that at least um, if I look on uh, obviously the, the discussion, the pressure we had, um, reputational as well for the team, uh, which I think that's that's most important. I think I learned a lot. I know as well that we are, we're not the only one, but eventually we have been the one which have been the most attacked, which means that as well in terms of communications, in terms of media communications, strategy communications, there is a lot you can do to protect yourself or to attack if you are uh, intending to attack. But uh, uh, I think, yes, um, more than the pressure, I think there's lesson learned a lot. So at least it, it helped me to develop as team principle. And today I feel a lot stronger in that respect. And how much of an impact did the changes last winter have on the performance of the team? I think that's, that's a no doubt. Um, the performance of 2020 has been affected by the TDs through the winter time. It has affected, I believe, not only Ferrari, most of the team, but we have been the one which have been the most impacted. Uh, I think that our car uh, is certainly s- slow today on the straight, yeah, because of power, delta, but as well because of a lot of drag, but the drag was on the car because we sought eventually to have more power than what we had finally. So certainly it has impacted, uh, and I think of this, and we had the lockdown, the freezing, which didn't help us in trying to readdress the situation through the, through the season itself. But uh, it, it, has, it had an impact, no, I think, that on that there is no doubt. And given everything that happened at the end of last year and where you are performance-wise this year, if Marchioni was still alive, do you think you'd still be team principal? Uh, difficult to answer, but I would say yes. I do not feel the responsible. I think it's, it's the entire team that attacked it. I, I had the full trust of Marchioni. And I think that having the full trust, it was, we were fully aligned and aware. Um, so uh, I believe yes, but we should. <laughs> I cannot say you obviously what could have happened. Okay, and how different then is life under Louis Camilleri? Is he a very different management style? Are you still being texted early in the morning? Uh, I think that Louis is certainly a completely different uh, type of leadership. He's a great man. He's a great friend, I would say. I think that together I, I found a friend with, with Louis. He's very supportive. He understands the importance of the stability. He understands the importance of the investing. And when you are investing, then normally the results are not always short term. It's more on a medium long term because you need us first to invest and then get the benefit of the investment itself. I think that um, he, he's a great person, a great leader. He's delegating a lot. Is texting me as well, but um, the reply in within 30 seconds is not required. <laughs> so at least, <laughs> at least that at least make quite a lot of difference. Yeah. Well, look, you're, you're very much uh, team principal. I just wanted to ask a little bit about what that means to you in terms of, you know, would you say your job is one of the most prestigious jobs in Italy? Can you describe the sense of pride that you you feel as team principal? I believe mean, the Ferrari, Scuderia Ferrari brand in Italy is very is very important. Each single Italian somehow is a fan of, of Ferrari. So when you are the team principal of Ferrari, that's that's the responsibility. Myself, I have to say that I I do not leave it in such a way. I. I think that being team principal or engine engineer, at the end you're part of the family, we've got each of us uh, our own role and I think that each single role got his own importance. So while I know it's quite a big responsibility, I do not feel it as such and I think that's my my luck eh? because at the end I'm not too concerned and uh, I try to do my job in the best way but I, I feel to be part of the family as all the others that are working in Ferrari are part of the family as well. So it, it's certainly very prestigious. I may recognize when, when I'm uh, walking in, the, in Italy in the streets, everybody recognizes me. Um, they do, do they? Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. When did you last have to pay for a, a, a restaurant uh, meal? No, no. Have on. you ever? <laughs> I, I pay. Uh, to, after, after this season, I'm paying, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but also, do your kids sort of live the journey with you and, and from, from your family's point of view? Yeah, they, they are. Um, 
But I have to say that uh, when back home, we never discuss work. I do not do it. Uh, I think it's my way of trying at least to, to separate the private to the, to the work. But I know that they are following. I know that they, they feel the pressure as well. Your kids feel the pressure, really? That's yeah, yeah, they feel. Uh, but kids, you know, it's uh, 23 years old and uh, 19, so they're not really kids. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I didn't realise they were that. Actually, Mattia, do they want to get involved in the team? Are they, are they into engineering or which direction are their lives taking them? No, 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 no. Not at all. Uh, not at all. So um, the oldest, so 23, when he started the university, he said, Dad, I, I will do everything but not engineer. I said, that, that's the best choice you can do. Why did you say that? That's interesting. Well, because, you know, I think that if... Um, I've been very lucky in my life because from a, I was even not the best student and I became team principal in Ferrari going through all the, let me say, the, all the steps as an engineer. And I think when you've got such a benchmark for a son, it's always difficult as well because then there is the challenge, there is the comparison. So if he's choosing something different to the engineer, I'm, I'm very, really, very happy with that. That's the eldest and is the, is the, the younger one he is going to go in... Is it a, a boy or a girl, the younger one? A, a, a girl. I don't know what she will do. She has to start university next year. But again, she's looking for um, anthropology, maybe. So let's, uh, let's see. I'm sure you'll agree that stealing this time with Mattia to gain such incredible insight into the inner workings of Ferrari, its history and its future is a real pleasure. But the 2020 F1 season isn't over quite yet. And if you want to keep up to date with driver views on the latest wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles and the biggest F1 stories, then you need to listen to the F1 Paddock Pass podcast on Spotify. Episodes are free to listen to and come out exclusively on Spotify three times every race week. You don't need a premium account to listen. On Thursdays, Will Buxton previews the weekend's action. After qualifying on Saturday, we talk to the star performers up and down the grid and look ahead to the race itself. Then on Sunday, minutes after they cross the line, the winners, the losers, the happy and the heartbroken tell F1 Paddock Pass the story of their races. It really is your complete race weekend audio guide. You can listen to F1 Paddock Pass for free. No need for a premium account on Thursdays, Saturdays and Sundays every race week only on Spotify. And hit the follow button to keep up with the very latest episodes. But for now, though, let's get back into the final part of our chat with Mattia. Now, throwing it forward to next year, 2021, uh, we're speaking in Abu Dhabi. We're almost done with this year now. How hopeful are you of getting back to the front with the new power unit next year? How's progress going? I think being back to the front will be very difficult because the gap of today is big. But certainly we can do a lot better compared to what we are doing. Most of the weaknesses of this car have been at least partially addressed, starting from the engine power. I think the engine power of next year, at least the engine is running well at the dyno. I think he's doing good progresses. I don't feel we'll be the, the less powerful next year at all. Uh, so eventually we'll be back in the battle in terms of engine power. Um, on the aero of the, uh, the drag, it's, uh, the drag has been addressed. Uh, the car, the, the downforce, I mean, you, you are always missing downforce. So it's, it's uh, where are we compared to the others? It will be difficult, but Mercedes got a very strong car, so I don't think we can match what they got. There is a change on the regulations, on the aero regulations for next year, which eventually is uh, for each single team that will be a new uh, starting point. But I think if I look both power and aerodynamics uh, 2021 the projects are progressing well if i compare it for in terms of rate of development compared to what we had in the last seasons i think it's a it's a great development at the moment but as i said the gap is very very big so i think we can be certainly more competitive to today uh, it will be less painful i'm pretty sure um, i think it will be a step forward now let's see how much uh, because it's all relative if you look at Mercedes this season, I think they stopped developing the 2020 car, no doubt, focusing on 2021. So I'm pretty sure they will come back with a, a very strong project again. So difficult to, to know. And I think it's uh, that's part as well of uh, what's fascinating in our, in our sports. Huh? It's, uh, you 
can never know where, where you will be compared to the others. But I know that we have progressed and hopefully we'll be somehow more competitive. And, and from a chassis point of view, how good is this year's car, the 20 car? Because it, it's been quite difficult to judge. Do you feel it is a better car than you had last year, just purely from a balance and grip point of view? But we have been faster in cornering compared to last year, but then losing too much on the straight. So the car itself in cornering was, was better. The car balance was not ideal. Um, so there was still, um, in terms of aero drivability, let me say, aero balance, something that had to be improved. But the chassis itself, I don't think, is the, the weaknesses we've got. The chassis has been frozen for next year as well. Um, so that's, that's the base. Uh, we played our two tokens on the back of the car, uh, so gearbox and suspension. That certainly again to try to have a better diffuser, so for for aero purposes. But uh, as I said, I feel comfortable with the progresses we are doing on the project on next year so far. But I know that the gap as well to the front is very big. Now another change for next year uh, is on the driving side. Carlos Sainz coming in. There's a lot of young talent in Formula One at the minute. Why Carlos? You're right, there is a lot of young uh, talents. I think that Carlos is fitting very well to our, to our team. As first, because Constructor Championship is important for Ferrari. I think that's no doubt. And you need to score as much points as you can each single race. And I think that Carlos is a very consistent driver in the race. And I think that has been the first reason why we, we looked at him. So he's one of those drivers that in the race, consistent, is fast, is is defending, is attacking, but is bringing always the car to the to the finish line and uh, uh, and in a consistent way. So I think he is is a good driver to build a good season in terms of constructors. Uh, then we we made an analysis on of the, his speed. I believe that he is fast. We believed he was fast, and I think he has proved even this season to be very fast. If you compare him to Norris, which uh, on the, already last year on, the, on his very first season proved to be a very fast driver, but I think that if you look again Carlos in 2020, uh, I think in, in the comparison he has been very strong. I think he improved himself as well in the quality compared to, to what it was before, um, and still very strong in the race. So he's a very hard worker. Uh, we before to, to main, make him an offer, we listened to all his radio communications just to, to see the way that he was communicating. And again, you can see that the way he's communicating is somehow telling you a lot about the way he's approaching uh, the exercise, very precise. I think it's... Uh, he's, so he's a hard work. He's, he's got the method. He's methodic. He's, he's, uh, he's robust. And I think that are all components which were important for us. On top of that, he's young, because while he's got already many years of experience in F1, he's still a young driver, so he's got a lot of potential still to develop. And he's not certainly at the end of his career. Have you been looking at Carlos for a while then? Uh, we start looking at him, uh, so we employed him at the start of the year. And uh, so I mainly I, I start looking at him in, during 19 season, so last year's season. It's quite unusual for Ferrari not to go for a, a big name driver. Is that a change in philosophy? You know, as I said before, I think we've got a leader on track, which is Charles. And then I would be very pleased if, uh, if uh, Carlos would become as well the leader of the track. So that's not that there is a number one and a number two. But we got certainly a driver on which we invested as Charles, which would have represent our driver for the next seasons. And uh, so, and, and for us, that was the big name. Um, so the big name is certainly Charles. And if you've got Charles, do you need another big name next to him? Eventually not. So if you need someone, is someone which is very strong, and I think Carlos is, someone who is very consistent, and Carlos is, someone that can beat Charles eventually, and I think that Carlos can do it. So it's um, the big name I don't think at that age is important, as I said, because of Charles. Second, I'm very keen to have two young drivers because, as I said, we are as Ferrari investing on our future. And when investing, I think that if your lineup is young as the one we've got, it's, I think it's the youngest lineup of Ferrari since 1968. So it's, uh, it's like wow. we are investing really on the future. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Now, look, because Carlos is coming in, obviously Sebastian Vettel's not going to be there next year. I know. You I've heard you talk about this before, but you've had a bit more time to reflect on it now. 
how tough was that phone call to say that you weren't going to re-sign Seb? The phone call was certainly very tough as first because I think that um, Seb was not expecting it. And I think that that was the most difficult one because it was something on which he was aware of then it's only a matter of concluding the, the, the discussion but he was not really, I think, expecting it. So tough in that respect, tough because of the, I think there is plenty of respect for the person and for the driver. But again, because I think he was not expecting, it was important for us to tell him very soon and early in the season. Because then he had at least plenty of time to consider his future and to organize himself for the future, which he did. I'm very pleased that he, he, can, did, he can do it. And uh, so, yes, he, certainly not easy. It's never easy when you have to say... Uh, a bad news to someone, especially if that is your top driver. Now, Seb came to Ferrari. Uh, he wanted to emulate his hero, Michael Schumacher. Why do you think it didn't work out for him? Uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's an easy answer. Certainly Ferrari uh, in the last six years, and because it's the sixth year of, of Sebastian, had a lot of change as well on the top management chairman, CEO, so we had a lack of stability, let me say, in terms of company during so six years, and that uh, didn't certainly help the project. Um, and I think that's, that's the main reason. of. Because I, I, Do you remember his victory in Malaysia 2015? I, I really felt at that moment there was some momentum building and it was all, all going to work out, but it just it never did, did it? Now, look, another driver who it didn't quite work out for on, on a championship basis is Fernando Alonso. Where do we start with Fernando, Matthias? I mean, it was a bold call from you guys to drop Kimi for Fernando in 2010. How were you so sure back then that Fernando was the guy? It's, it's a difficult answer for me because obviously I wasn't... I was not involved in the discussion, so when you are at the time, uh, I think I was still a young guy, <laughs> and I was still uh, simply focusing on the engines, and uh, so it's not a decision on which I was involved. Um, Fernando was certainly very fast, huh? he, he, he is very fast, he is very strong, and thinking he is um, very demanding, uh, he is very hungry. Now tell you the reason why we change I have not the answer for you but how painful then is I mean we're talking in Abu Dhabi how painful is that memory of Abu Dhabi 2010 he came into that race leading the championship by eight points and even now Matthias, I can see him stuck behind Petrov I, I've, it's sort of burnt into my memory I, I can't imagine what it's like for you even before being stuck between behind Petrov he was Mark Weber stopped, I think, for his pit stops, pit stops, and we stopped immediately straight after, which we, I think, all recognized by the time that he was in the pit lane, that was the wrong call. And I think that, uh, so we understood, but just a few seconds too late that it was the wrong call. And, uh, and then when he was in pit lane, and then we are on the back of the field, not being capable of overtaking, and as you said, being stuck between Petrov has been really a painful race. And... Uh, I think there are moments that I will remember very painful uh, as the one that you just mentioned, the one in Abu Dhabi with Fernando or the one of uh, even Felipe Massa in Brazil, huh? crossing the finish line being world champion and finally, <laughs> and then finally not realize a few, few, yeah. few seconds after realizing you're not. That's another one. Felipe Massa is an interesting guy, isn't he? He deserved that world championship. Is, is that what you... I mean, he was world champion for half a lap, wasn't he? Was that his best season for Ferrari? Yeah, I think he has always been a good driver. Um, he learned a lot with Michael. I think he has been very fast as well. And in that season, I think he was really deserving the, the, the championship. And I think it's uh, all circumstances that you do not manage, but are there. And uh, if you would wrote a, a film, you would do it like that. So it's, uh, it's quite incredible. Look, final question on drivers is is with Fernando. Are you surprised to see him coming back next year? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because I know that he's, if you look, he's still in good shape, very good shape. Uh, he's still very fast. I think that um, 
and you, when you are in good shape and you love driving, uh, I think you will, you will never stop. I think that uh, is really, um, as I said, he's still hungry. So I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm keen that he's back. I'm very happy that uh, Fernando will be back. He's a driver. Uh, I've got great memories, good feeling with him. Um, we kept in contact uh, while he was not driving in the, in the F1. So I'm, ve I'm very, very happy to see him back in the circus. And I think it will be, it is great as well for the F1, huh? him being back. Yeah, no, he, he's... Uh... He's a personality, isn't he? Would you ever work for another Formula One team? I never had really the, the opportunity as first. And I think, as I said before, I'm, I'm so pleased to be in Ferrari because I always had the opportunity somehow to develop myself that I do not even consider to have necessities to change. So, and, I, and as I said, I'm, I'm not working in Ferrari. I'm living in Ferrari. I feel that part of my life. And I think that if you are working for Ferrari in F1, why should you change? Well, Mattia, wonderful to speak. Really appreciate your time. It's It's been great. And I hope you have a, a good sign-off this weekend in Abu Dhabi. Have a good race. Let's conclude the championship and let's be looking forward for the next one. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time. Ciao, bye. What an extraordinary conversation. Mattia gave so much insight into this legendary team and there were some funny bits too. Can you imagine Ferrari having to reshape the first corner at Fiorano because Schumacher didn't like it? But on more serious matters, there was no shirking from the team's recent troubles and how the shifting sands of management have made life difficult. There was no doubting Sergio Marchionne's peerless vision. Equally though, there was no doubting that he was a hard taskmaster. He always wanted answers and quickly. As we head into the season finale in Abu Dhabi, let's wish the Scuderia well. I'd love to see them add to their three podiums from earlier in the year. Mattia, many thanks for your time. It was great to chat. Well, that's almost it for this week. But before we go, let's dive into the virtual mailbag once again to see what you've been saying about the show. And you enjoyed hearing from Lance Stroll, my guest last week. Diego Joshu got in touch to say this. Lance Stroll on Beyond the Grid is just wonderful. Love how he opens up and shows his soft side, and also how he handles his critics. I personally believe that he deserves his seat. Frankly, everyone in Formula One does. Well, yes, Diego, yes, and Lance has a soft side, and I thought it was fascinating to hear how he handled his critics too. He's resilient, be in no doubt. And besties on the podium tweeted to say, Lance, Never forget the fact that your eyebrows rule the paddock eyebrow game. Great shout, besties. Although the brows might have to raise their game next year when Fernando Alonso returns to Formula One. His are pretty mighty too. And Kevin Clayton said, My favourite episode of Beyond the Grid with Lance Stroll. Him entering Formula One was what got me reinterested in the sport, was so good to have a Canadian back on the grid. I'm excited to see my two favourite drivers with Aston Martin next year. Well, you must have been pretty excited, Kevin, by Racing Point's 1-3 finish in the Sakir Grand Prix on Sunday, because it bodes well for your two favourite drivers next year. As ever, thanks for getting in touch. And if I haven't read out your message, please know that I have read it. You guys and girls give me a lot of pointers. And if you want to get in touch with me, I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter, or you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week for one more extra special show before me and the gang settle in for the festive period. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, yep, you guessed it, keep it flat out.